And hello, 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 boys and girls. Welcome back to the stream. It's your host, Marley Startled. Um, we are today, in this uh, weekend, so first we're going to do is we're going to be enjoying that. Uh, but for now, the plan of action is to do a tutorial. I've had a request from one of the viewers to uh, do a tutorial. Now, I am no expert in the game. I do ignore a lot of the, feature, well, a lot of the battle features. But uh, I will try and explain the game from my... Uh, my... my my lived experience, hashtag TM, of, um, of playing it, of how I think it works and how to do it yourself. Uh, so the first thing we're going to look at is actually the game options. So um, these will reflect, I would explain some of the uh, features here, which will reflect your game, whether or not you want it or not. So we have things like European interventions, of course, I think you've seen it in some previous playthroughs. If you get enough policies in place uh, and if you do enough victories and uh, apply enough diplomacy, you can have the French uh, or the British intervene in a war. Uh, from that stage, they will start sending uh, ships and uh, armies. However, it takes quite a while for them to send it to an effective number. Um, normally, it's more to do with the um, national morale hit but if you want that turned off so you're not going to have any European intervention at all, um, you can take it here. However, it's very unlikely that you need to do that because the AI will very rarely get enough European intervention to come in. From here, you've got continuous VPs. Uh, we'll move, then when we move on to the battle map, we'll talk about victory points. But primarily, these are the points you can capture on the map to give you enough, um, enough points or give you uh, points that will help you win the battle. Uh, these points affect the national morale of the battlefield and after uh, you reach a certain point that's when the AI will automatically withdraw or you will be forced to withdraw. This forces the AI to act aggressively and also act, forces you to act aggressively uh, which means it stops corner camping and things like that. So I would recommend having this on. Readiness, so we'll explain the readiness mechanic but primarily it slows down the game uh, and if you want a fast place uh, game and you want more offensive, more battles, uh, and less strategic thinking, then turn off the readiness. Um, but uh, I like to keep it on because it makes it more complex. Fog of War, again, self explanatory. It's, it's about Fog of War, whether or not you see the enemy, whether or not uh, you can see the armies on the map, uh, and so on. Or delays is a pretty important one. So, uh, as you can see um, well, in, the previous, in my previous videos, Order delays are uh, effectively, but I've been claim, complaining about them for ages, especially between generals and things like that. Uh, and I've shown the messenger system. So messengers send orders from commanders to uh, from generals down to divisional commanders, down to brigade commanders, uh, and this takes time. Now, if you don't want that, you can just tick that off and have to treat it like a total war game. But um, you would lose that strategic element and that element of uh, uncertainty. So I like to leave it on for that sort of realism aspect. Feuds are pretty fun and they add character to the game. Um, depending on who's commanding your brigades, who's commanding divisions, you can have feuds between commanders based on their personal snacks, uh, their previous abilities or previous actions on the battlefield, whether or not they routed, whether or not they got a lot of people killed. Uh, and this will in turn impact what these generals who are feuding do so if a general who feuds well a commander who feuds will refuse orders uh will do their own orders um and will effectively act as a wild card uh meaning that you can't really rely upon them on the battlefield but then again you can expect them to be a bit more independent in, in their mindset so it's a catch-22 sometimes you can have a feuding commander who's almost like a really good commander who would do his own thing and um and uh will act for actually a, a more improved AI <laughs> or you can have it as a guy who's a complete liability who's a complete nightmare. So those are your main options on the uh, on the actual game option screen but we'll go into more details when we get to the battle map. Then we move on to the start campaign. You've also got historical battles but really the game spreads about it is this. So open up a start campaign, what is it? So you have on the left hand side scenarios. Different scenarios, different starting positions, different uh, situations economically, militarily. So across 1864, things aren't looking good for the Confederacy. 1863, things aren't looking too good either. 1862, well, 1862 looks a whole lot worse if you... Oh, no, no, no. Then 1863. <laughs> 1862 looks awful. 
uh, and uh, and so on. I like to start in spring 1861 because, of course, none of the policies have been selected yet, um, and none, uh, the armies you can build your own armies. Whereas in 1862, 1863, it's more like jump straight in. You've already got armies. Let's fight the battles and, and uh, get to it. Here, of course, you've got your flags to, to, to pick who, um, which side you want to play on. So if I'm going to play Confederacy, just click this, click that. Uh, and then the AI has different bonuses. So what do the bonuses reflect? It reflects national morale. National morale is basically the willingness to fight. If you get it below 25, you win the war. So you want, if you want a longer campaign of a much more harder AI, you whack this up to 50, uh, like I have done uh, in my current campaign, and it becomes a nightmare. Uh, difficulty does not reflect if the AI gets bonuses. It just reflects how aggressive they are, uh, meaning how often they attack. So if you want a more passive union, a more historical union, then you can have, it, say, a mediocre difficulty. But if you want a more aggressive union and you want to be more on the back foot as Confederacy, you uh, can play for very hard. Same for the other way around, but I personally believe the Confederacy is not very good uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of um, aggressiveness, so often charge in with weak troops. So I wouldn't recommend it. Then, of course, you get down to your starting focuses or your starting bonuses. So you get different bonuses depending on each nation. Let's start with the Confederacy. You can go for the historical bonuses or Dominion in Cotton on Alliance with the Natives, or you can pick random ones. This will allow you uh, a different style of gameplay and influence how you play on a strategic map. But let's talk about the different um, different starting bonuses. So Old Dominion, primarily it will get Confederate uh, will get Virginian support up by 10%. Normally Virginia will secede regardless, but Virginia will, it's a guaranteed secession um, with this uh, focus and um, it has higher state support, meaning more recruits, recruits with higher willingness to fight. Really, on face value, it's not that a good a starting bonus because normally Virginia will secede anyway, and so you can go elsewhere, but, and the capital's closer. The capital ends up in Richmond, which you actually don't want anywhere near. So um, it's probably, if you want to be a meta boy about it, you probably want to discard this. And the three state Southern support up by 25, and they'll become a slave state. So that means that, uh, of course, I've never really picked this, but it's highly likely that they flip uh, on secession. Um, and you, with higher state support, you get higher morale uh, on units you recruit there, and higher manpower uh, in terms of volunteers and so on. Slaves to the West, uh, these are all basically just, uh, in this increases, increases recruitment, increases population, um, increases trade with, uh, with Texas and um, Texas starts to a higher upgrade level. So this means that you will uh, have basically a slightly more, I keep on saying basically, sorry guys, uh, you, you'll end up with a stronger West. Again, not really that necessary, probably a bit of better things to pick from apart from this. Also, such as Union, you get loads of state support. Again, as a Confederacy, you don't really need that much state support, so it feels like a wasted focus. Normally, you have quite a high state support anyway. Um, filibustering, this is a meme, uh, meaning that uh, you end up with Cuba under Southern control, which um, you can recruit from, but there's literally no point in doing so. Sure, you get increased trade, but there's, this is a meme, filibuster, starting bonus. Um, it's not worth having. King Cotton, now that's a pretty important one. This will allow you to go up to Agriculture 3 and Agriculture 4 for King Cotton and also allows for um, what you'd call the European Intervention uh, Strategy. Um, as you can see, European Intervention level plus 20. Um, this is a good focus. This is a good um, bonus if you want to go for European Intervention uh, and I would recommend it if you want to just to push it over the line a lot quicker. Um, otherwise, you've got to wait a lot longer. But apart from that, agriculture doesn't do a lot, so you're sort of, it's, um, it is really, it's the main thing what, what attracts you to this will be trying to get that intervention uh, level as high as possible early on. Injustice Association is a very strong one for the Southern uh, for the Confederacy, because this will allow you to go up to level 3 and level 4. Um, also, Confederate population up by 25%. Lower unity due to religious and less and recruitment towards slavery within the immigrant population. 
reducing national morale by five. So this is a, a this is baby penalties like national morale down by five, but you actually have a massive population or a much healthier, stronger population compared to the Union. Uh, and um, with the high industrialization, you are going to get more guns quicker, uh, which is really um, really important uh, as the Confederacy because your limiting factor initially will be manpower, and then once you get to conscription it will end up being guns and you want as much guns as possible so this is a focus for guns uh, and manpower which is really really good i would recommend this if you want uh, an easier time as confederacy arms agents um, these will steal weapons from the union at the start of the war uh, so it increases your weapons by 50 percent meaning that you can kit out larger armies earlier so if you want to go for an early push or an early yolo arms agents are definitely um, a thing to have also, it's uh, with the current patch, weapon production is very um, is very uh, difficult to uh, to get uh, to get, well, improve right now, uh, and so you want as many guns as possible early on just to tide you through the war. Native allies don't really do much. So in the territory, you get plus twenty five percent, but uh, it doesn't mean anything right? because no, no, there's no value there. It's just a nice, nice neutral one. And then Southern Pacific Railroad, this is really good. So you will start with a Pacific Railroad to the south. Um, you will get a credit rating plus two and higher railroad capacity and construction speed. So, so this is really good. It means that you can spend more for longer. Uh, it means that you get increased trade. So again, good economy and um, construction speed plus 25%. It means you can grow quicker. So the holy free is industrialization arms agents and Southern Pacific Railroad because you have that high industry, high staffing weapons, high construction, so you can just explode as the game goes on. Um, if you're going for more just a, a diplomatic approach than King Cotton, um, I would go for just uh, arms agents and even industrialization or have a spare boy at your disposal. But really, the, 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 apart from those, the rest just feel like a wasted slot because Saw is nice to have higher state support, but most of the state supports will be higher as Confederacy anyway, so you don't really need it. Um, especially if you intend to win the war earlier. If like, you get to 1864, then let's be honest, boys, you're, you're, you're going to struggle. But anyway, that's the three. That's, that's, your, uh, that's your policies, uh, and then we'll move on to the Union. So the Union policies are a bit more... Count, uh, almost, what's the word? almost like countermeasures to the Confederacy, uh, just to stop whatever bonuses the Confederacy has. So Underground Railroad is the obvious. This is very good in the long term because an annual reduction of minus 5% of the slave workforce, of course the Confederacy is supposed to have most of its uh, economy from a slave workforce and most of its production. So if you can do that, you can reduce its production, reduces uh, the Confederate economy uh, in the long term, which of course weakens it over a longer period of time. So I would recommend the Underground Railroad, definitely. Uh, Kansas Free State, yeah, this is just, um, you click this to stop the Confederacy getting it, basically. It's a, it's a wasted, it's a wasted slot. It's, uh, it's, it's a wasted slot. Kansas is too, uh, it's not got a high economy, not got a high uh, population. It's not worth it. Go West, plus 25% population in California and Oregon. Oh, higher state support in California and Oregon. Improvement made possible in said states. The trade capacity of the Santa Fe and Oregon trails doubled. Never really we really picked this one, um, but it looks interesting to have. I mean, very rarely you have such a large Western campaign. Um, so um, again, manpower is not really a big issue for the Union. It's uh, actually pretty uh, excessive, so there's no need to pick bonuses to manpower. So it's, I guess it feels like a weaker version of, say, bread basket or industrialization. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for this. Support abolition. Official support for hardline abolitionists will make sure that any southern sympathies within the union. Let's go. Southern support in all states within the union. This is a, a, a wasted one as well. Confederacy will always start with very high state support. There's no point picking support abolitionism. Um, unless you're going historical. Uh, because it's just a waste of slots. Sure, it's a nice little minus 10 to uh, the Confederacy's national uh, state support, but it's not necessary. Force Neutrality Act, that, all against, that will just stop the Confederacy yeeting over and taking Cuba. This, this is more of a countermeasure against uh, the Confederate um, bonuses. 
So this greatly improves European uh, intervention, uh, European relations, which you don't really need for the Union because you don't need European. Well, you can't have European intervention. Uh, you just you, you just aim to get um, Antietam, the uh, obviously called not Abolition Act, the uh, uh, you know what I mean. Um, but you just you pick that policy and it, and it goes. Red basket. This is good if you want to go agriculture. But why do you want to go agriculture when you can just go industry instead? Industry is much more important because you can actually get guns from it. Agriculture, you do not get a lot from, uh, so they wouldn't recommend it. Industrial tradition is always a given as a union. So you have more railroad lines, more prep relation, uh, lower level of unity, minus five. That's a, a really petty low reduction in unity and allows you to go industry three, industry four, which is a high, which you really, really do need to speed up subsidies and speed up construction. So I would recommend this always as at least one of your slots. Um, security measures, this will stop the Confederacy having 50, well, basically reduce Confederacy weapons by half. This is a bit OP early on, um, especially the current patch, meaning that Confederacy West won't have any guns, any decent guns, so you can just roll over them. So security measures is a tad OP. Um, again, this is uh, this feels like if you want to crush the Confederacy early, which is really pretty easy to do as a union. Continuous policy of retaking indigenous tribes. So you get plus military experience, uh, uh, but for both sides, uh, and plus union morale, so this is a wasted slot as well. You're basically giving both military to both sides, and you've got plus five union morale, so who cares. Union Pacific Railroad, always a good one. Industry is always a good one if, if, if you, when in doubt, pick industry and guns. So, again, this will just uh, basically be the Confederate, uh, the Union version of the Confederate tree. This will give you plus two credit rating um, and plus construction speed. In short, you can either go to attack the Confederates' manpower or to boost your own. So, you can. I tend to go this fellow. Uh, Union Pacific Railroad and say Underground Railroad, so I get my own boosted industry, my own boosted construction, and I also reduce the Confederacy's um, Confederacy's um, production and, industry, uh, and economy via the Underground Railroad. If you want to try something a bit more uh, tasty, uh, if you want to try something a bit more OP, you can go say security measures, industrialization. Um, and Underground Railroad, so you start with a really gimped confederacy. It's actually a really powerful uh, bonus. Or if you want to try something a bit more different, you can try this fellow just to keep the uh, Europeans at bay, even though they very, very rarely get involved. Um, so Union Pacific Railroad and go west, and that's, that's a meme. That's probably a really bad build if you, if you, if you want to gimp yourself. Um, but sometimes you want to give yourself just to give the Confederacy uh, a chance. So just focus focuses across these three, which are very, very powerful. Um, but, well, which is very powerful. This is not powerful. This is not powerful. But um, so this will give you a much more balanced game of the Confederacy. But those are your main policies. Normally, I don't really. I had to look at some of these fellows because normally I just don't even bother. I like looked at them once and thought these are garbage and immediately moved elsewhere. And so, um, really, the big ones are this fellow, this fellow, and this fellow. Um, or if you want to be OP, this fellow. But still, let's start new as a union. We're just going to talk through the UI and things like that and discuss it from now on. Oh, I should have picked. I should have picked a decent scenario, bro. Yes, yes, yes. I know. I know. So here's the campaign map. Pretty self-explanatory. Red denotes Confederate states. Blue denotes Union states. On the Left, you have messages, for example, when people arrive, places whenever they're withdrawn, uh, and you click on the messengers to speak, uh, listen to them. Date on the top left, 
number of ma filled in manpower. Current income or treasury. Current expenditure. And debt rating. You don't really need to care about these two things. All you really care about is the debt rating. If you get debt rating below B, um, you can no longer recruit more men, buy more weapons, or build further ships, which means that uh, your you get you, your growth halts. Not too bad as a union, but as a confederacy, it's pretty pretty big oof if you're trying to keep on keep on par. But um, you don't want that high. You want to keep that creating rating above B. New transports. So these denote. Uh, if you want to do travelling by sea, travelling by rail, travelling by uh, river transport, for example. Uh, I don't have an army right now, but if I did have an army and I right-click down here, I could pick the option and select by railroad. Then they would move our railroad down into their destination. This, of course, would then use up some of this capacity. And uh, and if we've got too many armies moving or too, uh, the armies are too big, we won't have enough capacity. This, of course, can be reflected by... Um, the economy uh, and the starting bonuses. On the right, you've got your menu. Yeah, pretty obvious map information. Uh, command and control. So when you click on a unit, it will show a command and control radius. So if you click on an army, so I don't have an army yet. Let's actually play this along uh, and show you your field of influence. Movement arrows shows you where you're going. Telegraph lines, so you can see telegraphs act as. Um, orders, so this is where it tell it, so the horse turns the base, orders go up to there, and then these should hit eventually a general. Um, if you don't have any telegraphs, so the telegraphs are pretty backwards, it reflects how long it takes for you to move your armies. I need to pick a policy, don't I? But I've never had a problem with it, so I've never actually upgraded or built any telegraphs. Supply lines. So, um, probably better if I actually built an army first, but supply lines dictate uh, how much supply you get to an, uh, to an army. Um, so, if I had an army here, there would be a supply line arrow when I click on it saying that there's supply coming from this supply depot. Um, if I don't, uh, if I don't have a supply depot there, or I'm not in friendly territory, where I have a, with a decent logistics line like this railroad, then I'll start taking attrition, and it'll say you are not getting supply uh, when I click on the unit card. Military icons, yeah, pretty obvious. Mm. Map borders, yeah, pretty obvious. Map text, you want to keep that. Battle memorials, this is good to get rid of. So if you fight a load of famous battles, a load of memorials will pop up. <laughs> A, lot, a load of big battles, a load of memorials pop up, which you can then probably get rid of because they block your, uh, well, they block you basically. <laughs> you can't see what you're doing. I'm only going to play to the first battle, boys, for this tutorial. And then map icons. Yeah, turn it off, turn it on. Um, I've never really worried about any of these. Just battle manuals. If you're playing a load of battles, sometimes the UI bugs a bit, and you can't click, click your army because of the monument. Monuments. Here's a little field book if you need uh, different. Uh, if you if you need a guidance on what to do. For example, we're on a pre-war right now. It's impossible to recruit to states that are still unsure. The war will start with Confederate forces once they take Fort Sumter. When the war begins, both sides will receive small starting volunteer armies and fleets. And then your quick map view. There you are. On the right, this is just your army tracker. So this will show you the state support. So if I mouse over here, it's like 90% state support here, 76 state support, 100% uh, state support in Washington, and then I go down here, 28 state support from the Virginia. I mean, that's how many how much support I'm getting from these states. So I'm not, I don't have a particularly high state support in Virginia, of course, historically never did. Um, but what will happen um, is you can't really raise your state support even with um, things like civil order. But what you can do, what to go to that? Is what 
what you can do is um, reduce their their state support for their own side, and you can do that via raiding, which right now is currently OP as well. Uh, most important one is the actual weather. Um, you need to know when the uh, uh, what uh, the weather, because of course, uh, if you're in bad weather, say in November time, December time, uh, and you get to below 48 degrees. Um, your army is going to start taking attrition because this is degrees Fahrenheit and not Celsius, so it can be quite confusing because I'm, especially as a European, so sometimes I move my men a bit early thinking, oh, it's boiling, but actually it's not. Um, so, really, 64, 62, this is sort of when you can start moving, but you normally have an indicator from the, uh, from the armies down here. Next, we will move on to. Right, so let's talk about some of the trivia. Normally things I don't worry about. So things like bridges, you take a bridge, theoretically it blocks the trade route further inland. Um, but no one really cares about it, especially in my games. This will tell you what it's transporting, uh, the money it's making, things like that. This is just weighted information right now because it's just esoteric. I wouldn't really worry about it. Uh, normally when you click on a town, will tell you if you normally click on a town it will tell you uh, it will tell you something about a town like what's producing things like that you can't change what's 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 producing you can't change what it adds to the game all you can do really is um, take it uh, which of course will bo uh, bolster your ability and reduce the confederacies or oh, reduce your opponents uh, supply depots, this desupplier armies, you can build it via uh, um, the army options, which we'll show later. It will tell you what is in the depot. So a lot of people speculate with the current patch that because you're building so many supply depots, other guns and weapons are going into supply depots. And so <laughs> that is why you're not getting weapons. But you need supply depots, especially in early campaigns. Um, because without supply depots, your armies will starve and they will become useless. So you need your supply depots to push further down into enemy territory and build large and large armies. Forts. So here you can see two couple of forts, uh, current number of men occupying, how many are injured, level of guns, morale, the commander, which of course will have different details on it. Uh, readiness, of course it's high readiness of fort, it's level of supply, um, ammunition, so when you go to, into the battle, how much weapon uh, ammunition your soldiers have, provisions, so if they're starving or not and forage, so things they've managed to capture from, uh, well, it's for horses, basically. Low forage, low quality for horses. Uh, down here you will see the situation, so you have different multipliers, so you've got telegraph, so very quick order to orders. Uh, bad weather, so they'll take some attrition, especially when they're, if they move. A status, what they're currently doing, their intelligence, so if they can see around them, uh, um, low intelligence means you won't know exactly where the enemy armies are and this will mean that you will sometimes stumble into an enemy or you'll see an enemy marker say here but you'll march down and you won't engage because actually the enemy army is over here. Um, this can be changed by things like civil order um, and um, higher deception uh, reconnaissance, uh, this higher quality troops in your armies and a level of training. Untrained troops perform worse um, but these get trained over time if you stay in one place um, and don't move around. Normally you'll get your training up over winter time when you're not going on the offensive. Then you've got military, oh uh, wait we've got your strategy tab. This is going to be a, a really general basic tutorial because uh, I'm, just, I'm just doing it as a, a courtesy. So this hasn't kicked off yet, so actually we'll uh, come back to this, we go to the military tab. So military tab, on your right you've got your many filters, uh, if for example if I want to find a name of someone, I don't know, Muk Lelen, well this is for armies actually, so this will show you armies and forces, you can turn off say garrisons and just have armies, um, and this will show you the different garrisons and different forces which, uh, which you currently have at your disposal. Show the commanders, uh, the history of engagement, and uh, to show commanding unit info. So, for example, if I look at this guy, he's got uh, no fame, he's unknown, 
So this may affect his... Uh, this may affect his... Ability to control uh, commanders further down the chain of command. They may refuse to follow him. Initiative, meaning how quickly they work. Um, if uh, if they'll take to, if they'll do their own thing or if they'll just follow orders. Um, low initiative means normally quite uh, quite stagnant, quite de long delays in orders, uh, and will tend to mean. Um, uh, tend to mean they'll just do as they're told, whereas high initiative uh, AI commanders will do what they want more uh, and will normally pre-act pre, uh, pre on your orders, which means that of course they're much more uh, much more effective at getting things done. Leadership is backwards, so this will of course affect morale of the men. Uh, administration, it's things like training and supply, so you want a, a, a command of high administration so that they can be trained quicker. So McClellan's is a good example, very cautious commander, but very good administration, meaning that you can keep him in an, as in charge of an army and just build up the guy's uh, control. Running, uh, this, this really this level of deception. I think this, actually, I th I'm not sure about cunning. I think it just reflects how much control of the starting map you begin with in a battle and history, when it was raised uh, and what the unit has done. So down here you can quick build armies, for example if I want to quick build a soldier I can click on this and click apply. I can't right now because of um, because the war hasn't started yet but we'll get back to that. Fleets, don't worry about it, it's a meme. Uh, it's basically just click this, build what you want. For example schooner, build it um, create a new fleet and say, let's go for Michigan City and apply a ship to it. For example, I want to build a motor schooner. I want to build a paddle steamer gunboat. There you go. If I want to drag troops over, and now I have my new fleet. If I want to drag troops over, I can go, ah, oh. ah. Oh. There you go. It's pretty simple. Um, not very complex in the naval aspect of the war. Like you don't really blockade rivers. You don't really do any of that sort of shit. All you do is build a load of garbage ships, or build a really good a few ships of a line, stick them on some ports, and blockade. But we'll go and uh, do a brief explanation of that. Um, plus, many of the costs to do, and as you go up the industry tree, you will get more uh, options to um, upgrade and pick better ships. But it's a uh, bit of a hangover. Officers, there you are. Different officers you can pick, say, McClellan, for example. Let's look at McClellan. That's not McClellan. Don't know where he is. Uh, I guess he'll turn up later. Again, it's a bit buggy, but here. He will turn up later. Let's not worry about that. In fact, we'll get to actually the war kicking off before we continue on. Unless I can do things like finances. No, we'll, we'll keep going until the war kicks off. Okay, so now we're at war. Let's pause the game. I'm just going to build up one small army. So where? So for example, let's look at McDowell. He's a start. He's got 10,000 men, 123 are disabled, injured from moving around, uh, other stem injuries, uh, and number of guns. You can see they're encamped, though they're not moving anywhere. This means that they will be training up while they're encamped. Uh, no intelligence, uh, good condition, but poor training because of course all of these guys are volunteered. So, let's look at this army. I believe it's the Army of Virginia. And look at what we can do. So, let's look at the command structure. Up here you've got your commanders. Down here you've got your divisions. Which later will become corps as you go up to um, Army, two, uh, army Policy 2. And down here you've got your brigades. 
So this is the chain of command, so to speak. Orders will go from McDowell to Tyler, down to all his subordinates down below. The crosses are infantry, the dots are cannons. So if we want to do a quick build, for example, if we're lazy and want to do a quick build of troops, we can either just go look, uh, one, two, three, speed build that and click apply. And this will automatically build three at full strength. Of course, if we want, if you are an idiot <laughs> and want to build three low strength cavalry cores, then you can press this button there. However, if you want to be a bit more um, historical or you want to be a bit more... Um, what's the word? If you want to be a bit more RPG-like, uh, you can go and say select a unit at main with state support uh, and pick. So you can see here, uh, if we picked a unit like that, you could see what state you could have picked them from. Uh, if, if you pick a state from far away, it would take longer for them to join the army. Uh, the level of support that state has, which will of course reflect uh, how, will it, how well they fight. Uh, number of men fielded currently, so if you've got a lot of men fielded by that state and they're taking a lot of casualties, you're going to have quite a lot of, uh, you're going to have a much lower level of state support. Level, of course, there you go, your casualties, your deserters, and level of volunteers available to you. So I can't recruit uh, a infantry stack yet, but I can recruit a cannon stack because a cannon stack is only about 100, uh, 200 men. Yeah, 104, whereas if I was to build a brigade, it would cost me 3,000. Of course, this is because it's early on, and I haven't uh, let the game continue on for a bit. Then you can pick what you want from these states, or what, what you want, volunteers or drafts. Volunteers will fight better, um, but of course volunteers are limited by their contract. And here's their contract for three months, the remaining three months, once the three months are, are over. A large proportion of those volunteers will leave the brigade, uh, some will stay, and if there's any more volunteers available, they will fill up what's left. Meaning that um, volunteers are good in terms of combat motivation, uh, but they are dangerous if you're not paying attention because uh, if you have not enough state support within that state and those three months take over, the, your brigade's going to go and you're going to lose all those men. You can do some a bit more upgrading. You can uh, say, there you go, look, here he is. Uh, we can give him a red red uniform and you'll be able to see that on the battlefield. Then we have things like weapons. So weapons are quite important. So as you can see here, if you can, we have uh, if you click on a unit and click upgrade, you can see the weapons available to upgrade. So right now we have Springfield muskets and Model 1817 rifles. Springfield muskets will tend to be the, the bog standard for the Union. They're quite easy to produce, and they've got a hundred standardisation. So we'll talk about this. It's a smooth bore musket. It's only available by production. There's two ways a weapon can be available via diplomacy and trade with European powers or production. And this weapon can only be available via production. So if you want more of it, you've got to go industry. Standardization is important. This means that if your standardization, I, this uh, has changed a few times, but from my understanding of it, it is to do with how much of your army has that weapon. If a lot of your army has that weapon equipped, then that will increase standardization, which means it's easier to produce. If you've got an army that has loads of different variants, then it's hard to keep a production line for, that, for all those weapons. So it's a bit of a meme because often than not, you're not going to have enough uh, enough of that weapon to make enough units of, for, that, um, for that weapon to get standardization high enough to produce more of that weapon. <laughs> um, and unless you're willing to have a very small army at start, just to have really high standardization, um, it's very difficult to, to build rewards. So often it's overlooked and it'll, and it'll be its own thing. Um, but if you can improve, improve standardization by picking a few weapons to keep as a mainstay of your army, then I would recommend it because that means, of course, you make more of those weapons quicker uh, and uh, more weapons quicker means of course larger armies. Price, don't really worry about the price, but effective range is an important level. So effective range of course dictates how far your brigades can shoot. If your brigade can shoot at 400 yards, of course it's much better to have that weapon than a weapon that shoots at 250 yards. 
So um, I wouldn't recommend. So for example, with the Springfield musket only fights at 250 yards, so it's garbage. You don't really want to equip most of your armies with it, but if you've got no choice, then that's what you're going to have to do. However, if you see a weapon like the Model 18617 rifle, 400 yards with 66 standardization, then um, you want to pick this bad boy. Uh, also, yeah, standardization affects price and things like that. Um, also, rate of fire, it's, it's really, really self-explanatory. You pick which weapon's better and you pick as much of that weapon for your brigades and your armies as possible. And then once you start running out, start picking the garbage weapons until you get down to mixed muskets and you just stop building units. So for this guy, we're going to pick the Model 1817 rifle and cavalry, you can have a few choices as well. And there we have it, a pretty easy built army. Um, if we want to change things around, let's say we want to change McDowell with, um, I don't know, Sherman or Grant. We can go on to here, pick Grant, and you'll be able to find good old Grant right there. So, again, these are your stats. Uh, because it's 1861, no one's really heard of him yet. But you got high, you got fairly decent fame, fairly decent initiative, okay leadership, uh, good, okay administration, okay cunning, which will uh, get better as it goes on. Uh, as you can see, it's already going up over time, which I believe is either random uh, due to combat experience or um, due to historical um, historical reasons. For example, Lee's always a really good commander. Uh, uh, McClellan's an always, always 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 a very good trainer. Uh, and Grant is pretty good as well, but as time goes on, these guys will go up better or worse, and it'll be up to you to keep an eye on them, normally on a battle, uh, and pick them. So, for example, we'll pick Grant to be in command. If you can't be bothered to pick all your tr uh, all your uh, weapons for your armies, just click the upgrade button, and that will automatically do it after selecting the highest level. So, if I select Grant, pick upgrade, all of these will be upgraded if I select the New, New Jersey Militia, select upgrade, all of those will be upgraded if possible. Uh, Militia Act 2. Next, we'll talk about the economy. Now, the economy is very esoteric. It's a load of gibberish uh, right now. Uh, all you have to care about is this credit rating. This will go on in the background, uh, there's not, not much you can change about it, you're at war, you know. Uh, but if you want to care, on the left hand side, you've got your tariffs, um, sales, so this is the money you're making, this is the money you're losing. You can't really change much, I mean, it's not like you can't spend money and lose the war because you don't want to break the ba balance. Uh, it just tells you how much money you're spending is a bit of a, a bit of a, you know, here you go, a bit of a, a bit of flavour. I'll tell you things like the uh, economy, like if it's improving or reducing because of the war. Uh, normally, you can't change that. Uh, it will just... It'll be a meme. Uh, it will just sometimes... It will just do its own thing. Um, unemployment, 10%, again, doesn't matter. National debt doesn't matter. Interest rates. This does matter to a, little extent, uh, to a small extent. If the interest rates are too high, then of course you won't be able to ever pay off your debts and you end up in a slippery slope. And your credit rating is all that matters. But this will just keep going down to the minuses as you build your armies, build your weapons. Uh, so this is just really all you need to care about is those interest rates so you don't end up in a slippery slope of constant debt and a debt, a debt circle and credit rating. Here, you can, if you really want to make more money, you can tax the hell out of people with tariffs and sales income and things like that. But uh, for the most part, you just want to have tax, tax as hard as possible to come up patch and then focus on subsidies. Now, subsidies are the important part. So, what are subsidies? These are things you can spend money on to give you higher bonuses, higher uh, to construction of industry, uh, di diplomacy, um, and recruitment, which means, of course, means higher impact and yeah, more manpower quicker, uh, more weapons quicker. Um, uh, better transportation, uh, better uh, better supply in home territory, faster, and so on, so on, so on. So the politics one, you spend money to get more policies, which are here, we'll go on to that in a bit. Uh, but they cost money, so you don't want to do this yet. You want to use up all your policies first, and then you want to go, okay, time to, uh, time to spend the money. Um, 
So right now I've got one of eight policies. I'll, I'll wait until I have eight policies. And then I will go, okay, I'll add, I'll add three more policies uh, at the cost of one hundred one million one million dollars. <laughs> Diplomacy, this will keep um, British intervention and French intervention down. Um, and it will also improve the rate you get European weapons. So good to have if, you, if you're worried about European intervention and also if you want to bolster your forces via income, uh, via diplomacy. And things like viruses, you know, basic stuff. Industry. Here's a little finger bobby. So it's just it's just it's just subsidies um subsidies of course subsidies increase production production increases more chance of, of, of weapons um so this will help you balloon out at the later stages think of it almost like vicky 2 from paradox um you know this you just subsidize everything to become a god at the end of it agriculture you don't really need to subsidize agriculture but um makes new farms new plantations more money so you can you can subsidize this but it's not really necessary i feel like agriculture is sort of the weak link as opposed to industry transportation trade that's all trade construction that's all you care about trade war that's an interesting one so if you want to blockade a the confederacy uh, you can spend money to increase a trade war which will do, act almost passively in the background to stop the uh, confederates leaking out trade uh, this is just a money sink really you don't you can let the confederates spend their money um but as a meme you can whack that trade war up high and go bankrupt doing it but um you can keep it about here and let's let the confederacy spend its money on trip blockade running recruitment is the most important one yeah availability of volunteers and drafts pretty pretty self-explanatory you want to whack this high up civil order state support um it reduce him it reduces loss of state support uh, and um, allows intelligent gathering in your own country or your own states. Good to have uh, to keep those state that's, um, state support high and to uh, continue executing the war. So I tend to whack all these high and just let the economy sort itself out. Next, we'll move on to policies. So here you have your financial policies. Long, long story short, money printing, uh, raising the debt credit rating. Agriculture, this, uh, if you want to go to be a green union, um, this allows, of course, European, uh, better European relations and um, more money. Industry, again, higher industry, better weapons, better ships, uh, more subsidies to industry, uh, to, uh, to industry, meaning more production, meaning more guns. You go down here to, uh, to, but uh, basically buff your, your armies in the long term. This is more to do with recruitment, your military. So as you go down, this will affect how you shape your armies. When you get to military two, you have a core system. At the left will be your drafts. And as the further you go down, more spending on recruitment, more changes to your military structure. And your right is your diplomacy, meaning you start getting guns from the diplomacy, uh, from the union. And you can spend more money on diplomacy to get more guns and better guns. So this is the difference between a policy and a act. So a policy will take a slot while an act will not. Um, so if I picked, say, government funding, I would use up one of my policies. But then I could use an act and it wouldn't use up one of my policies. So if I picked funding, I would then be able to, say, pick print notes uh, and I would still have a couple more in the bank meaning that you don't have to worry too much about the blue lines. So what, what I tend to do early on is, of course, recruitment, because you're going to struggle uh, as recruitment, as well, uh, rather ironically, at the start of the wars of the Union because of the low draft rates, um, at the low draft contracts. So I'll go to uh, Military 1, get the Militia Acts, then eventually Military 2 to get conscription, and then I'll switch to, say, industrialization or Diplomacy. And as soon as my credit rating starts dropping down to say BB, BB plus, I will pick funding one and the money printer. These every act, every act has a has a penalty, but often you won't really see the penalty. For example, if I print notes, I'll get a load more money. 
but public wealth will be reduced by 10%. Who cares? <laughs> like, I don't care about public wealth. I mean, I will get loads of money, uh, which will keep my debt rating high. Now, if I say pick the... Where is it? The oh, Emancipation Proclamation. I will get higher state support, higher national morale, but uh, the competitive rule as well. So each pact has its own, almost its own penalty. Very few... Um, they, yeah, every act has a, a cost and a balance. It's just that the costs, um, the cost and the benefits, but the cost is just not important. But I tend to go down here, get down to at least uh, Militia Act, and then get conscription. That box ticked, so I never have to worry about manpower. Then I'll switch to, say, industry as the union. Then I'll switch to government funding. Whenever I start lo running out of money, uh, or whenever my credit rating starts dropping, I'll bump up print notes. And if I do get desperate, I will do government funding too. But as a union, you shouldn't be really, really worrying about this. Here is a real funny esoteric thing. Reduction. Here you have a, a, a graph to see how your production's going. And you can see every single thing. Bit of industry uh, and uh, the level of production within each state. How efficient they are, uh, how much they're being taxed, their value, uh, slave ratios, how many slaves they have there. So apparently in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, they have, oh, let's do Union. They've got 40% slaves. So for example, now that I, I, if I have the Underground Railroad, they're going to start losing those, that, that slave workforce. So here we are in New Havon, uh, let's see, in Hartford, CT. We've got a workforce of 10, slave ratio of zero. This is what they are producing. Guns, weapons, uh, steel, is that steel? And uh, value. How much they're being taxed. So again, you don't want particularly high corporate tax during the war and their efficiency. So they're not very efficient right now. They're just probably starting up. This is just a good keep track. So if you want to keep track, just keep track of uh, how much your production is going up over the years. Uh, and how many profits you're making. <laughs> uh, right now I'm making no profit, but uh, hey, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, and this will work itself out. So you, it's, this will eventually just keep going up uh, unless you're getting actually ravaged by uh, invasions or war or your economy just get, keeps on blockading and keep on, keeps on getting blockaded. So it's not really something you've got to keep an eye on. So I very rarely do, but you can, if you want to, you can see, you can see, see what it is at the start of 1861 and see what it is by the end of your campaign. And then your goods and trade. So what your goods you've, uh, you have and uh, the import value. So things you're importing, things you're importing. For example, if I click on this bad boy. Uh, oh, I don't know. It's actually, actually pretty, pretty, pretty basic. Uh, so here you go. Artillery. If I click on, art uh, let's see. Artillery ammunition. Uh, let's go Union. And I believe this is time period and the amount of money I'm spending on it. So for I mean, uh, artillery, this is the amount of money I'm spending on it. The average price, so it will tell you about how much it's going for, the demand. Uh, high demand, of course, means higher price. Production, uh, how much you're producing per year, which of course is starting to produce more and more, and how much is in stock. And then of course, imports, exports, how much you're exporting to the... Uh, to Britain and how much you're importing from Britain um, and uh, your different trade routes. This is uh, again something you don't really have to pay much attention to but if you are trying to keep track of why you're not getting enough guns then of course you can go through here go here and think okay my production is pretty low but then again what can you do about it um, you can't do much so you just whack up the industry and just try not to make as many artillery pieces. But it's just a nice way to see uh, a, a grander scheme of things going on. So let's move on to actually looking at the armies. So we have on the table on the left things like intelligence, condition. Really the only thing you have to worry about is condition. If the condition gets too poor these are auto routers and readiness. Readiness is very important and you build yourself up over time and the rate you build it improves as uh, your troops get better. So readiness reflects how offensive you can be and what things you can do. 
at low readiness, you are completely defensive, unable to move, unable to build things, uh, unable to use things like forced march, and just generally just a complete uh, liability. Sometimes you would just automatically be pushed out onto an automatic route. Um, mediocre readiness, you can stay on the offensive stance in enemy territory, but you cannot move around in enemy territory, and you can build stuff. So this is really the danger area once you see readiness. If you're in this sort of readiness when you go onto the offensive um, and you end up stopping, start building depots and waiting because if you get to this level you will just starve and you'll be forced to withdraw. Uh, Amber, this is where you can start moving around in enemy territory. For example, if I click this bad boy, I can start moving right now. Uh, and green is like full readiness, you can do force marshes, things like that. Down here is the different stances you can use, so the offensive stance meaning that you engage anything and attack anything in uh, enemy territory or any, any territory whatsoever. So for example if I move the offensive stance down here they will immediately move to take Alexandria and then they will move to attack down the bottom act. Defensive means that they won't attack unless they are attacked, uh, these guys will just hold out at Washington and if you move them in a defensive stance they'll try and avoid engagement so they won't try and take Alexandria and they won't try and engage the army of the bottom act unless the army of the Potomac has an aggressive start, then they will engage. Army orders, so different things you can do. For example, you can do guarding for your cavalry. I never really picked this. Um, stops routed men behind the battle line, which reduces desertion. Guarding cavalry will not fight as units in field battles. Okay. These are just little, little things you can have as a bonuses. As bonuses uh, at different costs. So here we'll just stop desertions and stop. Um, but then you lose the cavalry. cavalry. Garden cavalry will not fight as units on the field battle, so that's a wasted slot, so that's probably why I ignored it. Raiding. Raiding allows you to uh, burn everything in enemy territory, uh, lowering state support and damaging things like supply lines, things like that. Very good in things like Virginia and high industry areas for the Confederacy. It will damage their state support for you, but also damage their state support for the Confederacy, meaning that actually you don't really it doesn't really matter. Or um, it's very unlikely that Virginia is ever going to flip in your favour. So you really just want to just damage Virginia enough that it has no longer support in the Confederacy. Currently broken, uh, you can't go uh, offensively and take towns and cities when you've got the raiding mechanic on, uh, but you can still fight in battles. And then you have your scouts. Improves intelligent gathering, pretty pretty much pretty obvious. And then these cavalry corps will fight in the battles, but the units spread out. So, um, yeah, it's uh, these are different bonuses. So, guarding, bit of a meme, don't bother doing it. Raiding is good, especially if you're getting bored of a campaign and you want to end it as quickly as possible. Uh, and scouting is also pretty good, if you, but I would turn that off before you go into engagement. And really, the most important thing here is the construction tab. So the, each army can construct things like telegraphs, sub depots, and forts. Telegraphs, uh, as I mentioned previously, will reduce the level of uh, delay between or the orders process. So once I send an order to him on the campaign map, it'll be quicker for him to move around. Not really necessary. Uh, you can wait around. Uh, armies will generally slow at this time period, so you don't really need to build telegraphs. What you want to build is depots. So a depot is very important. Um, a depot supplies your armies and um, stops your army starving. So what we're doing right now is we've just clicked the depot and we've just put it down there. Now because it's in our sphere of influence, which we have two spheres, one sphere I believe is for uh, area control and here is potential to reinforce. So if you've got following armies nearby, uh, they have a potential to reinforce you in battle. So here you can see I've put this down and it's been constructed in 19 days. Once you've constructed it, you can click on the on one of these bad boys and upgrade it. Right now this is a fully upgraded supply depot, but the higher up, more upgraded it is, the larger it can support, um, the more troops it can support. So if we click on this army here, we can see where these guys are being supplied from. See it's being supplied from the bridge or from the river line. 
and it's being supplied from this depot, meaning that it's got full and easy supply. But once it moves into enemy territory, eventually it will move out of range of this supply depot and you'll have to build new ones. Meaning that you've, eventually you have to stop. I can't just march all the way down to Richmond. I've got to stop along the way, putting down supply depots before I advance south. Of course, supply depots can be taken, and if you take it, you can uh, take enemy supply depots, you take their weapon supply. Uh, for example, if I destroy this guy in this battle right now, I could knock this guy out of any nearby supply depots and you'd have to build new ones or starve. Meaning that you, if you uh, can continue an offensive uh, and you can be pushing enemy back, you can eventually just overstarve the enemy. Uh, and another thing you can finally build is forts. So you basically build an area of control on the map. A fort will slow down the enemy uh, and also keep control on the area against a lower a, a small sized army. I believe you can upgrade forts, so I just never worked out how. Um, you put about 15,000 men in via the tab here. So, for example, let's find a fort. Uh, oh, little bug, little bug, yeah, little bug. Yeah, little bug. Oh, wait, no. There we are. So, here's a fort. I can put three guys in. Bam, there you go, job done. And you don't really need to build a command line for that in a fort. And the more troops and more cannons you have, the longer the sieges go for. Uh, as a rule, uh, as a general rule, uh, meaning that it takes longer for them to take a, say, a town nearby and allowing you to come and reinforce. So in the example, here's Annapolis and here's Fort McHenry. Fort McHenry's nearby and it has an area of control over, say, Annapolis and uh, the supply depot. Before the Confederate army can move forward and take the supply depots, it has to take the fort. Leading to a siege, leading to you, you buying time to come and reinforce that, and or leading to potentially winning the siege, depending on the size of the army. If the fort is ignored and the Confederates just march off, then eventually these will flip back to the Union. So, if I was say playing the Confederacy, I could build a load of forts along this main route, meaning that if the Union was to come down I, uh, and push me back, it would buy me time to regroup and resupply, whereas they've got to slowly grind their way down into territory. Uh, vice versa, if I'm moving on in advance and I want to protect my flanks because I've got a small army, I can build a couple of forts, put a couple of guys in it and keep on moving down. Forts are pretty good but they are pretty buggy as well because you can't fight them. They are done by auto-resolve, meaning that um, basically uh, you've got to let the AI decide and sometimes the, the way it works out is mad. So here you've got different indicators. So example, level of invasions, blockades, etc, etc. Here's a good example of what's going on on the left in Missouri. We have the Department of the West, it's an enemy territory. It's got 95% supply, but it's got no supply lines. If you see here, it's only getting supply from this river uh, by the green arrows denoted. Um, it is currently trying to win St. Louis so it can take the supply depots here. If it doesn't win St. Louis, then it will starve and um, be pushed out of that objective. So it needs to win, basically. If it doesn't take, take St. Louis, it won't get a sphere of influence uh, of the local area and it will die. As you can see, its supply depots, its supply is slowly dwindling. As the supply gets worse, uh, attrition will get worse and this will become a problem. The only way you can fix this is building your own supply depots or retreating out of the enemy territory like so, using a movement icon. Sorry, using a movement icon. And then building up a supply depot nearby. So I'll build a supply depot here. Once it gets to its destination, Come on now. He says. There it is. They are a bit fiddly to put down. Build a supply depot. This will build up. This will be close enough for me so when I go and move on to offensive action, I can take St. Louis. If I had stayed there with my 1,800 men, I would have ran out of supply too quickly. Without that supply, my men would have uh, died, basically. A mass attrition, mass uh, reduction in condition, eventually leading to an auto route. So you need your supply depots and to, to move on the offensive action. 
Okay, uh, things you can do is say forced march, retreat, meaning you won't engage anyone and just try and run as far away as possible. Move at time, this is a bit of a meme, you can pick a time when you want to move here, force up if you want to synchronize movement, but you can essentially just pause the game and order it, you don't really need to. Different forms of rail movement you can click there, so for example if I want to move by river mo movement, I can click this, select where I want to go, and it will cross ride a river to see. And do its thing. But uh, we don't want to do that, so let's click cancel. And let's put it back over here. But there's different ways things make so. If you're wondering why your army's not moving by rail, probably because of that. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, what else can we talk about? Uh, let's talk about the navy because it's an easy thing to cover. Uh, I'm going to add some more men to this army before we go to war. Before we go to the battle map. Okay, uh, mixed muskets. So, Springfield rifle muskets, much better. There you go, 400 yards. They're really just the, the sweet spot if you can get them. Springfield rifle muskets are great. Um, so, let's look at the navy. Here we have a couple of navies, uh, you can build them in the fleet. So this is the Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Um, if I want to add more troops, for example, ships in the harbour, I'll just give it to these guys, like here, have more of these ships. It'll take time for them to get here, but once they are, they'll inflate the numbers. So, here's the ships, the level of ammunition you've got, um, provisions, uh, fuel, and awaiting orders. Ships are a complete night nightmare to micro because they've got to be in a port to uh, resupply. So here we are, return to port, return to port. And they won't do it themselves, so you can literally starve to death without if you uh, if you spend too long out at sea. That's why I very rarely focus on focus on um, the navy. You can see its condition is barely afloat, it's saying it needs to be repaired, it's a complete disaster. Now if I say select the Gulf Blockading Fleet, which is down here, if I return you to port, you can see still its provisions and its supply is awful. You don't really want to be using it, but we're just going to use it for this example because why not. So here we are down in Florida just chilling. Here's the uh, Tampa port. So there's different stances. You can be defensive, pretty much just works the same way as an army. You won't engage unless uh, the enemy force wants to engage you. And, uh, or you can go offensive. What really matters for these guys is the fleet orders. So you have things like, I've got to send you out. Oh, you've been damaged. You've been bugged. Bruh. I guess you got bugged and so you're not longer there. Uh, what about the home squadron? There we are, so you've got fuel and coal. Uh, this won't come back on its own, it won't come back by supply. And so once you get to your destination, it's uh, you're stuck basically. You're either going to turn around and run away or accept that your troops are going to be, uh, your fleet is going to be in very low condition. Let's move a fleet down here. So we're going to move our fleet down. And it's, pretty, yeah, service factory coal. 54% need coal for steam engines, consumption low when fleet is stationary, when fuel runs low the fleet will need to return to port to resupply, meaning that it's going to be a micro hell if you want to actually do some proper blockading, not worth doing. Because it means that you've got to keep an eye on your fleets and be like, oh, okay, it's time to send these guys back. Provisions, how much food they've got, not enough food, well you've got to return back to port. Ammunition, not enough ammunition, guess what, you're going back to port. And then there's different orders you can do. Well, he says that, but I can't actually select these orders. I've got to get him there first, I guess. But then you can return the port as a click button to return straight back to port, but you don't know what port they'll be going back to. So I look forward to that. Oh, wait, wait a sec, see if I tell him to stop. There we go. This is new. I guess not. I guess you can ignore it. So, and it would automatically do it itself. So 
So here's your raid option. The fleet operates opportunistically against small detachments of ships, so go around attacking smaller, weaker Confederate ships. Patrolling, patrols up and down, stops any enemy ships. Not really necessary because you're not going to get a lot of naval invasions from the Confederacy, if I'm honest. And blockade. Blockade is the most important one. But, uh, the fleet will patrol the coast, intercepting any merchant ships. So this is the one you want. You click this bad boy, it will do its blockade. Uh, sadly, it won't move around and do it itself. So this is actually a meme, it won't automatically do it, it's a lie. It's a lie. You actually want to move it. So you want to move it somewhere into its field of radius. For example, if I want to move it down to here. And all ports are in command range are affected, so move it down. Just take some time. And as you can see, it's as tedious as hell. You get as close to these ports as possible. Ports can be a nightmare. Uh, if, if you get too close to a fort, then uh, you'll be engaged in a fort at a door as a, uh, as a fleet. Then I select blockade, and these will start blockading now. And there you are. It will now do its blockading. Now, because this port, this port, uh, this port, and this port are all being blockaded, they will no longer be functioning correctly. So you've got one Washington blockade, you've got Hampton's blockade efficiency, Annapolis blockade, etc., etc. But they should pop up soon with uh, this guy blockading as well. But it's got very low efficiency, so you probably want to buff more troops. Sadly, normally you could click on this and it would take you around, but there you are. Now you can see these, these guys are taking damage. Um, if I could highlight this. There you see, blockades and raids, cumulative losses and tax revenue, 245. Now, if I go for a couple of days, let's go for another day. Go 245, let's do a month, shall we? Probably because Fort Monroe is already here doing blockading as well, so that's probably why it's being such a nuisance. But that's, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. So I, really, if I moved it further down, but you can see here that the fort's nowhere near. This is taking uh, blockade damage. Um, so if we look at this, 11k blockade. This is cumulative, so the more fleets you have doing it, the better. But it's garbage because eventually you run out of coal and you have to micro and send them all the way back, which is a nightmare. This is what the fleets are really for, uh, not much else. I mean, you can have river fleets, things like that, but for now, there's no need to because you don't really need, you can just march down. I guess you can have river fleets to get around quicker, but I feel like it's not very quick anyway. You still run out of supply very quickly. So it's best to march. Still, it leaves you open for different strategies. For example, you can send an army down to invade, I don't know, Florida if you feel so inclined. But for the most part, it's not that necessary. So we've built our depot. We're going to upgrade it. And you can see now we've got more supplies coming from these guys. And these guys are much more happy and ready to move. On the left, you see there's only one supply route. And that's right, this river line. So if I move off and move into enemy territory, I'd have to capture this enemy supply line. As the war goes on and the enemy starts building supply lines, it'll, it'll, be, less, it'll be less Bob the Builder because you'll be able to take the enemy supply lines and carry on down. But um, early on, especially if you're being offensive as a Union, you're going to go back and forth. But that is really just the Navy. Um, then you've got your railroads, so you can construct railroad. So if I click this, here's your railroad. So if you want to build railroads, you click down here. Of course, more railroads, better economy, more transportation. So you can build a railroad here. Uh, build a railroad here. It'll make you go bankrupt, but don't worry about it. It'll make you build a railroad there. And then you can also build railroads elsewhere, but that's all you need to do. 
And with these railroads built, these will make transportation quicker, supply easier, and life generally easier. Um, I've not I've actually just stumbled upon this, if I'm honest. But uh, railroads are good because supply is rapidly improved. Now these will slowly start being constructed over time, um, I believe, and then you no longer have to worry about it. Cool, that's all. Uh, I don't really, I don't normally never have actually done this, if I'm honest. But now you can see it's 68 degrees. It's time to march, uh, and we've got decent readiness, so we're going to march down into our first engagement, where we'll then discuss battles. Okay, so first thing we see is this is being taken by because we're in close proximity. It will take time to take cities and towns depending on how much uh, manpower you have. And once you've taken it, it will flip over to you, meaning that you can uh, take the enemy's territory and so on. So this guy is retreated, much to my irritation. Let's see if I move up over here. So if I want to move, say, like this and use a railway. And we'll try that. But I believe it's the enemy railroad, so it's probably not going to work. Okay, we're taking our sweet time trying to move around. There we are, first engagement. I'm just going to scroll down and see if I can burn any more of these railroads. No, I can't. Okay, I guess these little red marks indicate uh, enemy control, meaning that you can't build and develop these railroads because the enemy is in the way, because the enemy owns this territory. Now, if you captured along the railroad, you could build it, but now you can't. So we've gone to our first engagement. Pretty clear how many people on your side, how many people on their side. If there's any enemy reinforcements, they'll tell you and how long it takes to get there. Uh, and the number of troops you have at your disposal, and who's building the first main army. Click this button, it'll take you, take you where you want to find the enemy, and then you have a choice. You can play the battle, you can auto-resolve, and let the, uh, the game work out for you. Go to defend, basically meaning that you move on to a siege engagement, uh, with a variable sort of t soft time limit to see how long it takes before you win. This will allow you to move more troops into the, into the theatre, on the campaign map before the battle starts but if you leave it like this then you're probably going to end up taking a lot of casualties then you have uh, this is good uh, actually if, if uh, armies don't reinforce in time but also bad in so far as that it's not uh, optimum because the enemy can also reinforce withdraw so withdraw is a limited retreat back uh, into rear areas which will mean that uh, you uh, potentially can retreat back into friendly forces, uh, but it's a bit RNG. Maybe your AI can will retreat down here instead. Um, or the complete retreat button, which is basically a, a larger withdrawal, perhaps taking you back to the, to the start of the state. Uh, these buttons are good. Withdrawal is good. Uh, withdraw, uh, retreat is also good if you want to get out of the state as quickly as possible because you've been starving to death. Um, but play battle is where we're going to go now to show you guys the next step. It's a little nice, uh, nice loading screen. It tells you the number of troops. Uh, sometimes it gives you a quote about your commander. Um, there you go. And here we are. So immediately you will be bombarded with information, but all you need to care about is the report. So again, tools. You have things like fog of war visualization so dark areas denote where you can't see lighter areas where your army is denotes what you can see uh, so here's where i can probably run into and see the enemy and then over here is where i can't see the enemy so I, there could be enemy right there i wouldn't know uh command info that will tell you oh, if, if i move this army up move these boys up come on There you go, command info. So here's your lines of command. So I know that Grant has all these subordinates and then all these divisions are all subordinate to these guys. Um, this is good to keep track of who's where and who's what early on where you're trying to work out who's in charge. 
Roots. Um, this would when you're moving, basically, we, uh, icons, ranges. So ranges of engagement. Uh, so example here, we've got cannons on the left. That's their effective combat range. Um, and yellow, if I turn it off, there you go. You can no longer see that. Uh, and the dotted yellow, if you can just about make it out, is what that's what range they've been ordered to fire at. So that's like medium range, which I can change with uh, orders later on. HQ. So here you have reports. This will tell you generally uh, general information about your armies. For example, consolidated overview. Click on this. Who is in command of this army? How many corps it comprised of? What divisions it's comprised of? And so on. Then of course you can do the same with the Confederacy. What's this cause? Who's in charge? Uh, readiness, basically, just their level of ability. Bearing in mind that this can, um, um, their willingness to fight and so on. So I might actually check that next time I play in my Confederate campaign to see how willingness to union are to continue on the fight. Um, but it's just more, you're not going to change much about it. It's just more to keep an eye on it to see if uh, it's being affected. So you can see it's level of training, it's readiness, and the intelligent gathering. Uh, condition report, this is more to do with general condition of its men, horses, so how many troops you've, well, just, just general state of, of combat rate of fitness. Again, you're not, this is going to be pretty apparent, you, you, this is going to be pretty obvious and pretty apparent to you on the map. Um, if they're flashing red, then these troops are probably going to have a low, uh, low, a low condition. Consolidated strength report. This is important. This tells you the general numbers of men and the casualty rates. So if you're taking a lot of casualties, you uh, and if you if you think you're taking a lot of casualties, you open this, think ah, maybe it's time to withdraw, uh, and you can make a decision there. Combat report. Uh, just the level of victory. So how many kills? If you want to see who's done the most damage, you can select say Stuart's cavalry the number of total victories or total per people killed and see ah oh, this guy's killed loads and then command report there you go leadership just general commanders fame leadership initiative and this like to see who's got a better better army then we have here second button which is messengers Oh, the starting message, uh, which will give you an even more general uh, representation of events. So it tells you who you're facing, tells you the guns, tell you the morale, and tell you the willingness to fight. And then over here, your capture points, which is pretty important to keep an eye on it. So here's your capture points. Uh, and if you click on them, they'll tell you where they are, so you know where to move forward how to, um, for your campaign. Next. We're going to start going through our armies. Ba -ba -ba. Come on. Oh, yeah, go there. So here's the, our forces. Uh, if we start with the Army of Northwestern Virginia, the commander uh, with Grant, it will tell you the number of men of total army, number of losses he faced, the number of guns, another quick way of, of watching it, and the general morale of your army. Uh, if the morale is pretty fucked, then, uh, then it will start saying, you know, unstable, uh, panicking, that sort of thing. Uh, you can reduce it down and increase it, and if you, if you press these buttons, you can go up and down the order of battle. So for here, this is the highest, but if I want to go down to my tours, I can click down, and start going along my course. So here's the first division, here's the second division, third division, fourth division, and so on. If I want to look at my cavalry, I go down even more and I can start picking between the units. See who's in charge and see what weapons they have equipped. Alternatively, you can just click this and just start clicking up. So if you don't know, if you've got infantry brigades everywhere and you don't know where they are, who, who, who their commanders are, you can go, okay, up. Oh, there's the commander. Here's a general order. So let's take a look back up to the main HQ. Here you have a list of things you can do. On the bottom of left, you can order of battle. And here's the list of what your army's basically order, well, the order of battle for your army. Um, the AI stance, how the AI will act, it will be aggressive, whether it will be attacking, defensive, or screen. Um, I never really clicked any of these, but I just think it just gives the AI a bit more of a 
a uh, its own sort of logic and whether or not it will do its own thing with, within its commanders. Here you have infantry squads. Well, here you have different orders, mostly rangers on the left, and then the little things your brigades, brigades and divisions can do. So on the left, this is like long range, short range, close range. Range. Uh, I normally order my men to fight at long range because. Um, you just do it generally more, but otherwise you're just wasting the, the, the range on your muskets. On the right, things like lay down against cannons, skirmishes to fight cannons, uh, and I believe this is uh, valley. So, for example, these guys will have a valley order, um, which will set the... Oh, no, this is charge. Okay, this is charge. Uh, so, charge is... A, um, you just click the enemy and click charge. Uh, or you can do alt and right click uh, and they will charge as well into melee. But uh, laying down is good and scampers are good. Charging, I'd never use it, you normally would bother using this button. Uh, for cavalry, you've got the same thing. So you've got cold steel, charge enemy with sabers. Uh, scouts, deploy a small party of mounted scouts, go around spotting for you, evade. Uh, if you run into any enemies, they'll try and run away and so on. Mounting, so get them off to horses, and if you get them off to horses, you can send them to loose formation, and then send to lay down if you want, and just treat like a skirmish troop. So this is a way of developing your troops up, uh, develop, setting up your brigades, and giving them uh, and improving them. Uh, go tell these guys to lay back up, stand back up, if possible. Go on, stand back up. Okay, it's a bit, 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 bit bugged right now. They'll stand up after. Um, yeah, so these are little things. I would recommend uh, treating your cavalry like really OP skirmishes. Uh, so as soon as they get into engagement, if they've got these different muscatoons, get them off the horses, get them into um, skirmishing and begin engaging. And then, of course, your cannons. You've also got your own orders here on the right. Bombardment, never really used it, but apparently it's supposed to be really good if you've got like a concentrated enemy line. It takes a while to build up. Click a place, click the enemy, and it will bombard. Uh, counter battery fire. This will focus the AI to fight on the enemy artillery. Uh, fire at will, let the AI do what it wants. And limbering will tell the uh, AI to get back, uh, to get the cannons back on the horses. Next, we have our commander's orders. So this is things like allow AI initiative, allow the AI to do its own thing. You can turn this off and hopefully the AI will just follow orders its own, uh, using its own, uh, just as, as exactly as, as you tell it to. And on the right, it will um, have different things that relating to the AI logic, for example, using high ground, using high rows, using cover. Detaching, you can detach units from its command and it will act independently, not really useful don't really bother using it um but it's nice to have if you've got like a core all the way over here there and um it's um it's struggling uh and it's and you're struggling to get orders to it rally here's the rally so the commander will rally the unit this will increase morale but also order delay so if you've got low morale in your troops you can have your commander start rallying the men uh but at the added cost of slower orders i may actually use this in my campaign but again it's easily overlooked building is the most important one this will allow your units to build defenses i think only infantry can do it you can build breastwork which is slightly weaker defenses and parapets which are stronger defenses but you can only build a which are basically trenches but you can only build parapets in um in the defensive phase and you can only do it via build points, not engineering points, which you get more as the world progresses. Movement, time to halt. I tell them to double time. I tell them to slow speed. Be self-explanatory. Army orders on the right. You can retreat your army, like do it this way, or, or you can surrender. I would never, uh, I would never surrender. <laughs> I would retreat always. Um, and then supplies. Um, you don't see it right now, but at the, at the end of every day, I will tell you supplies. That one on the right is speed and time. So let's begin. I tend to order my men using the general commands. I will order my men well, because uh, I've already sent a load of orders, but let's get this right. So I'll go to 10 speed. Wait for the orders to, uh, to, go to, to be dispersed. As you can see, there's a little, uh, there is a little uh, 
clock on the left hand side that is basically saying that this unit is awaiting orders so if i click extended single line it will now be waiting for an order lay and now it will start sending out messengers there you go there's messengers each messenger will go to across each core commander or divisional commander which of course will take time depending on its pathfinding and then eventually depending on the own commander's stats it will send its own orders out to its own troops and order it to order them to form extended line so you can see this is taking a very long time and there you go now it's acted because these are very, very rather low trained and now they've got formed a nice sweet extended line i'm not going to try too hard to win this battle i'm just going to demonstrate it to you um again if i want to order a, an army-wide long-range engagement to order to modify at long range i click on long range Wait for the delay. Out comes the messengers. There'll be another delay. And then they'll fire at long range. And then we'll start moving guys up. So if we scroll out, so we can do Alt, uh, hold Alt as well to move around individual commanders. So for example, if I want to move the general around, but I don't want to move the army, I can use Alt and right click and that will move the general um independently if i just want to use um and that way you can move if, if your general is like if your if your core commanders are standing right in front in front of an enemy firing line and you're thinking mm, maybe i should get this guy out that's the way you can move him without moving your entire force so let's move these guys forward there we are we're moving the army forward and there you see things like move at signal so um you have to execute the order i don't actually know how to do it i'll be honest with you but because uh, i never actually bothered doing it and move that time again it's a nice flavor but not necessary uh, and then these things here will pop up when you get into engagement you've got charge advance um withdraw and retreat so charge will mean that your unit if it's close to an enemy will charge to where you've ordered it to meaning that it will uh, run as quickly as possible and if it hits anything along the way it will engage in melee advance which is a bit broken, broken right now means that it will advance to wherever you have directed it you ordered them wherever you have ordered them to move but the, if they see any enemy in range they will engage as they slowly advance a bit like fire and move so they'll fire move forward a bit fire move forward a bit and um withdraw and retreat are basically the same but withdrawing and retreating towards the enemy uh away from the enemy so here we have our orders we click ok and then of course the orders will move out now let's say i don't want that to happen it's uh, uh, uh i suddenly the enemy's here i need to stop it from happening uh you click spacebar spacebar is the order to um is the command to halt measures will be sent out to halt um uh, which will take time so that's why you want to move up quite piecemeal slowly you don't want to move up like all the way up up here because your army is going to get fragmented and um it's going to be a lot harder to all cancel the orders now let's say i want to move an army i want to move this division uh here but now i want to move them elsewhere over here you can do that by right doing this right click drag and then right click drag here so what this will do is they will move to complete the first order first and then they will move to complete the second order so don't get confused don't think this has cancelled the previous order so if i click this and move this they will first move there and then they will move there so it's you're, you're setting orders in stages this can be bad for beginners because it means that um they think they've changed the order but actually they haven't and it means that now they've got an army moving all the way around here and here when when actually you wanted them to stop and move directly there just make them stop you click spacebar as so spacebar they've immediately received the order to stop and then you can you, we can begin to move them forward again and that is a big rookie mistake um a lot of people make it's like they'll, they'll they'll think they've changed the order but they haven't so if they've ordered a, a an army to move there uh, and then well a division to move there and but they quickly wanted to move it over there they'll send the order to move over there and they're still moving up there so what will happen is the army will move all the way up there to move all the way back 
over there, meaning that sometimes they'll go via the quickest route, meaning that they'll move all the way there, then move all the way into the enemy line, which is what you don't want. But spacebar is your friend. You can see they're moving along the roads. Uh, we've got no feuds yet. Uh, you can tell by a feud by uh, a little icon on uh, next to the unit saying that uh, which, which is either red or grey. So these are slowly ploughing on down as per usual. Quick, immediately quick on click that click on ten speed, and so on. So as it goes, well. So as you can see, this has become very chaotic, uh, and this sort of simulates that once you start sending orders in this condition, especially with the general as far away as possible, you are going to end up with uh, a very long order delays. Also, if you've got, say, a division over here, the generals are going to be potentially inclined to stand about there, meaning that, of course, it's going to take longer to send orders in general to the rest of your force. There's the engagement. Immediately going to click spacebar. Click spacebar for everything. Uh, let's order everything to stop. And we're going to wait. And hopefully it gets uh, to our men in time. And immediately skirmishes are coming out, which is bad. Can't retreat it back yet. And unfortunately, until the messenger gets here, these guys will continue following the orders, meaning that this can lead to a very chaotic and bad situation. However, this is quite good because of one of one of um, the AI is not completely <laughs> well stupid. Um, if they are marching into somewhere and they do run into enemy or they do engage, they will stop what they're doing um, and move to engage the enemy. So they're not going to this normally just run into the enemy they'll well, they will they will get into range and they will stop and wait for further orders so this is good and it's a good way of stopping um and it's a good way of stopping say just uh, a bad order just committing complete massacres for your men so here's a cannon now i could order counter battery but i don't want to and we're slowly going to start moving up our line of battle Normally, early on, I will order via the divisional level. Uh, I'll initially do the initial orders via the general level to move the entire army somewhere, and then eventually I'll start sending orders via the divisional level. And then eventually, once engagement is made, I'll start sending orders via the brigade level. So here we have our cannons moving into position. Sadly, none of these guys ever got the memo to stop what they're doing. And here we are. So if you want to charge, we hold Alt and right click and they will charge the enemy. Normally you don't want to charge with just one core. But uh, hey ho, it is what it is. They will charge into melee and they will immediately route because of course you don't charge with one cab. So we'll take our skirmishers and move them forward like this right click drag so you can see the advance button these guys will slowly advance forward doing their own thing until they get into position in the meantime we'll send the rest of the armies up like so and move to engage these will all wait for orders before they move forward unless it's bugged Oh yeah, there's a, there's a bug right now that if the blue line disappears, they won't move forward. We'll order all our troops to disengage, or to dis de horse and go to loose order. Depending on the order you're giving, depends on whether or not they have to have a, uh, a messenger. It's mostly messengers are for movement, so these guys won't need a messenger. There we are. Come on, get off the horse. And I have to cancel this order. 
unless I click the charge button, which will automatically cancel it for me. Or not. Or not. Let's cancel you. That's why you do have to be very careful and sometimes quite passive, otherwise uh, you end up say, marching into a deadline. Now let's send these cores up to engage. So, these guys should move forward, these guys should move forward, and the cannons should keep on engaging away. The cannons will automatically pick um, grape shot, uh, cannonball, depending on the situation. There we have a bad AI. It's advanced into the enemy, and this command has decided to lie down, which is not good. At this stage, you want to get on your horse and run away and charge through it, but uh, hey-ho. You can also order right-click to move into melee range, or move into uh, firing range, but the bug with that is they will chase, which is not good. Uh, so if this route, for example, they will chase um, they will chase that enemy uh, enemy unit sometimes into certain uh, certain destruction. And you can see the AI is using its own logic to lie down. And we have an enemy route for the brigade. Now, because I've right clicked in uh, melee, they are, there's a potential for them to. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's a potential to uh, for them to chase after, which is not good. So here we have a cannon. Best way to deal with a cannon is skirmishers. And you can see they're firing at medium range. That means they're just going to stand there and get ripped apart. So you need to fire long range, or the AI, or the AI command, commander may eventually decide, in uh, infinite wisdom, to uh, to actually uh, fire at long range, depending on how long it takes them to stop drooling. Really, McDowell? Come on now, guys, hurry up! Uh, get on your horse and charge this. Get on the horse. Sadly, we do not have a lot of men in these brigades. But cannons are extremely deadly to infantry, especially frontally. You don't want to uh, really be engaged like this. Also, a lot of these commanders uh, have a mind of their own right now. And they're just the tea horse. Again, a lot of the AI will use its own initiative, and there's not much you can do about it. And there you have it, failing right flank. Fortunately, these guys charged, they were quite intelligent. Not intelligently, the uh. Ah! You know why? I reckon I know why. I know why this AI is playing up. Because of this. The assault button. They are, they, are, they are predisposed to assault everything now. Which you don't want to do. So you want to turn that off. And that will make the... That is quite an interesting... Um, interesting... Uh, interesting policy you can do, or interesting, uh, what do you call it, be disposition you can send to your men, but it's not a good idea. Um, it's better just to micro, otherwise you end up with this and the AI just frontally charging and uh, throwing its life away. So that's why, that's why they are charging so uh, vehemently, because of that. Again, you want to send out skirmishers if possible, but sadly it's a defeat. So, this was just a dry run, I couldn't be bothered to uh, try hard too much because I didn't want to wait for like two hours, I just want to show you the different features, I swear. 
but uh, there you have it. Uh, now with the defeat, uh, you'll be forced to withdraw, and there'll be a time limit for you to withdraw. You will withdraw automatically, but it just allows the enemy time to uh, crush you, so to speak. Um, this is good for you as well, meaning that you can crush them. But um, if I was doing this properly, I would have the cannon moving up behind. I'd have I'd wait until all my units are in position before I moved into melee. I would have flanked properly on the right uh, and use that right flank to drive them off the field rather than um, charging centrally with my cavalry. Still, and then you have your casualties and your losses. And that is more or less a tutorial. But I would avoid using that AI predisposition. Um, it's the first time I used it, that's why so many of my troops were, which were frontally charging it. But the AI predisposition is not good because it will just they, it, will call, it, it will make them charge and, uh, and act very idiotically. Instead, it's best to micro and have that off and let the AI, uh, uh, let the AI have just some ba basic control over, um, over the battle. Still, that was a tutorial. Um, I suppose I could, uh, I could play another battle, but uh, I'll, this will end up being a day-long nightmare <laughs> of uh, another Union campaign. But uh, it, it's uh, pretty self-explanatory, uh, different options. Um, things I recommend for, for cavalry is dismounted skirmishing, uh, if they've got anything other than uh, mixed cavalry equipment, uh, dismounted skirmishing. And if they haven't, then charge with two or three supporting brigades. Um, infantry, if you come across enemy can uh, always fire at long range and um, if you run across any cannons send out skirmishers because skirmishers beat cannons um, and the cannons uh, focus on counter battery uh, if the enemy has a lot of cannons if not, try and set yourself uh, in f not in front but in an opening in your lines or on a hill to fire down on the enemy um, because then, uh, actually, they're very deadly against enemy uh, enemy infantry brigades, and actually can be form part of your of your of your forces. You don't need a battery; you can actually have them within your divisions. Um, apart from that, those are the best I can. Well, that's uh, that's the tutorial. There's not much else to say. Um, but um, I hope that's helped you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll now move on to back for blood after I have a smoke uh, and then after lunch we'll play a bit of alien isolation because I want to play that meme game still someone asked for this um, this tutorial now if you've watched I, I am a bit salty about losing this battle I am I am a bit, a bit honest but if you've seen my previous videos and my previous campaigns you know full well that I'm, I'm fairly competent at this game but still there's your there's your tutorial now we're gonna see this guy retreat See, the retreat is currently broken, it's actually going to retreat further into enemy territory, which is a bit bruh. At which stage, at which stage they will start, slowly start losing equipment and they're going to, you're going to need to retreat them back. And because they've got low readiness, they're going to be slow movers and it's just going to turn into a complete cluster. So you want to be, actually do be careful, you just don't want to let YOLO in like I have. And because they've originally initially lost the battle, they're going to keep on withdrawing and end up in this constant slippery slope. Uh, this is the latest bug from the, la the latest patch. Um, this will hopefully get fixed later on, where you retreat further into your own territory rather than retreating further into enemy territory. Otherwise, you just end up with a load of troop armies starving. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you have any further questions, just comment uh, with a question and I'll answer. Uh, thank you for watching and look forward to Back for Blood. Uh, yeah.